Find the reading tonight in the book of John, chapter 9. And Jesus, as he passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. The neighbors therefore and they which before had seen him that he was blind said, It is not, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him, but he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam, and wash. And I went and washed, and received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. It was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I wash and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They said unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him. He had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son? who you say was born blind. How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words speak his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, He is of age, ask him. And again they called the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner, no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Twenty-five verses, if correctly read, out of the ninth chapter of the book of John. May we pray. Dear God, tonight we are conscious of the grave responsibility that hangs upon us. We are grateful for the service that has preceded us, for the blessings that has been to all of us that gathered. We come now, Father, to look into thy book, and we pray that you'll take thy servant and loose his tongue and illuminate his mind and give us holy unction. We pray, our Father, that tonight may bring honor and glory to thy Son, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. We pray, Father, for every church that's represented. We pray for these pastors that are here tonight who have various and sundry problems, burdens. 
We pray, O oh God, that you'll increase their faith and increase their strength and the grace that they need to battle with the problems they're confronting, to carry the burdens under which they go. We pray, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, for the leadership of our churches, that some way, somehow, these days may refresh them, may encourage them, and may strengthen them to go back to the test in the local community and advance with the kingdom of God and magnify the Lord Jesus and his church above everything else in that community. Lord, we pray tonight that you'll send a revival in our churches. Grant our Father that the power of God may so permeate these churches that are represented that a spiritual flood shall come. We are praying, our Father, with the sincerity of our heart that these days shall cause the rivers to get out of bank. Know, God, how we pray tonight for those who are lost. Save them by thy grace. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those of us that are saved, that you'll revive us and refresh us to where we shall become flaming evangels, where we shall drink of the water until there'll be an overflowing river from us. Lord, we pray tonight, get glory in this service for Jesus' sake. Amen. Over in the book of Samuel, 1st Samuel, 10th chapter, and the 26th verse. And Saul also went home to Gibeon. There went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched whose hearts God had touched. They went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. The need of the hour in which we exist in 1977 in the midst of the onslaught of the world against us, the adversaries, the enemy who is putting forth every effort that he can to defeat and to discourage and to depress and cripple and blight and try to destroy the influence of the church of the living Son of God and of genuine Christianity. There's a desperate need, my friends, and people are crying out for a leader like they was crying out for a king. Because they cried out for a king, God gave them a king. Many are crying out today for men that shall lead us out, that shall lead us to victory over the enemies, over the forces of evil, over the adversaries, of opposition on every hand. But as this was given to the people, he also gave them a, some men that whose heart God had touched. And the need of this hour is that we shall have some men and women, young and old in our churches, that whose heart God has touched. The need of this hour is God-touched hearts. We are a great deal of getting to other things, things that are appealing to the heels, things that are appealing to the hearts, is not much today. We're living in an area of intellectualism when a people's brains are being appealed to, when people's heels are being appealed to, when people's flesh is being appealed to, 
And my friends, the need of the hour is that we shall get some men and women and youth whose hearts have been touched with God. And when hearts are touched with God, it'll get their heels in the right place. It'll get their heads in the right place. And then it'll get their flesh in the right place. So the need, my beloved, is not more intellectualism. The need of this hour is not more educational, and I'm not against education. And the need of this hour is not more physical and social entertaining of the flesh. The need of this hour is touched hearts, changed hearts. As a man thinking in his heart, so is he. And until we get our hearts thinking on the things of God, until we get our hearts concerned with the compassion about a lost world, until we get our hearts loving the things of God instead of lusting after the things of the world, we're not going to advance very far in the kingdom of God. These men, they were men whose heart had been touched by God. And things happen to people when God touches them. When God touches the human heart, some things happen. First of all, the thing that happens when God touches human hearts is there's a quickening. You have a quicken who were dead in trespasses and sin. Over in the book of Ephesians, the second chapter. You have a quicken who were dead in trespasses and sin. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience. Among all, so we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were made nature of the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It breaks down that disobedience. It breaks down that rebellion. It stops our course. Notice what he said, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespass sin. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There's been our problem. The wrong fellow's charting our course. And it's brought division and it's brought rebellion and it's brought confusion as we've gone about it. And we've all had our conversations in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. But God has quickened us. And when God quickens you, you're no longer dead in trespasses and sin. When God quickens you, you're no longer a prisoner of sin. And the first thing that God does, my friends, he brings about the quickening. And you have the quicken who was walking according to the course of this world, who was letting the prince of this world be your leader and who was living a life of disobedience. But we stop to remember that Paul was a man of rebellion. Paul was a man that was against Christianity and Christ. Paul was a man that was going according to the course of this world. He had a great intellect, but he, he had the wrong course charted for him. He was going against the church and against Christ and against Christianity. He was going with fleshly religions. He was going with that that appealed to the intellect. But when God touched Paul on the road to Damascus, my friends, the rebellion left him. And the stubbornness left the thing. And to hear Paul say, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And I'll tell you, we need a bunch of hearts touched. Folks are trying to get away from doing anything for our churches trying to get away from doing anything for our God. They want to do their own thing and go to their own places and live their own lives and live a life of rebellion and disobedience. But I'll tell you what we need. We need the Lord God to touch their hearts 
until he'll fall down in the presence of God and say, Lord, what would thou have me to do? It's not a matter what the crowd I run with is going to have me to do. It's not a matter what the religious crowd's going to have me to do. It's not a matter of whether I'm going to be popular or not. When Jesus touched old Paul, all of the worry about his crowd and his gang and his way went to nothing but dung and dross and he said, I jumped the whole mess in order to get Christ. And the next thing you hear him saying, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Are you concerned about what the Lord wants to ha have you to do? Or are you running around trying to do what the party that you run with and the gang you run with and the crowd you run with? Are you wanting to do what they want to do? Or you want to do what the Lord does? The Lord loved the church and gave himself for it. Are you loving the church and giving yourself for it? Or are you trying to create confusions, divisions, and strife? You're trying to find some alibi for quitting and picking out and running with your crowd. I want you to know one thing. Paul was against the church. Paul didn't have any use for it in Christianity. But when he met up with Jesus and the Son of God touched him on the road, he took for the church. The church is afraid of him, but the disciples said he's for us. He's with us. And you never heard tell of Paul fighting and bucking and rebelling anymore. He joined in with the crowd that loved the church and worked for the church and served the church and honored God with the church. And there it is. So my friends, and the Samaritan woman at the well, she was a harlot. She's trying to satisfy the lust of her flesh by yielding it to men. Her concern was her flesh be gratified, her sex be gratified. But when Jesus touched her, my friend, she didn't keep on hunting men for sex reasons. She didn't keep on hunting adultery men acts. She went into the city and said, come out here and see the man that's told me everything I ever did do. Come and meet him. Come and hear him. A lot of you today, when you get pre when the preacher preaches against your sins and names your sins and expose your sin, you get mad and blow up and blow out and blow off about the preacher's too fanatical, he's too hardball, he's too radical. If you ever get right with God, you'll say, Come and hear the man that's told me all I ever did. You'll want him to hear that man. If you get right with God, the reason you're rebelling against preaching of the truth and plain preaching and calling it radical preaching and calling it a fanatical preaching, you're just not right with God. When you get your heart right with God and God's man preaches the whole counsel of God, then you'll say, Hallelujah, come and hear him. You'll say, but preacher, or to preach the love. Where'd you find that in the Bible? Amen. He said, all scripture. Not two-thirds of three-fourths. All scripture is given by inspiration for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteous living. So my friends, if they preach the gospel, it's going to be doctrinal and it's going to be corrective and it's going to be instruction in righteous living. It's going to call you from the world and from the flesh and from your heels and head to your heart. Then my friends, just like the woman at the well, she said, come out here and see the man that told me all I ever did. What are you trying to do? Get up a gang to quit the church? Get up a gang to run with the world? Get up a gang to dance and cuss and drink and frolic and nightclub and honky talk? Or are you trying to get a crowd to go to the church and hear God's men? When you get a touch from God, you go out to get men to come to church, young people to come to church. You won't be running around trying to get them to go to honky tonks, beer joints, dance halls, nightclubs and hell holes in this country. Come and see the man that's told me all things. Are you trying to get people to come to hear God's preachers? Hear God's singing? Feel God's moving in the hearts of people? What about it tonight? 
that reveals who you are, who's charting your course, what crowds you're running with, and you're full of rebellion. You know what you need? You need God Almighty to quicken you. And when he quickens you, then there'll be something else taking place. When God touched also, my friends, Zacchaeus, old Zacchaeus had made fun of Jesus. He laughed at Christianity. He climbed up in a tree and said, ha ha, here it comes. We're going to see it well done. Jesus come along said, hey, there he is. That's the Jesus bunch. That's the Jesus man. Jesus stopped. He sees me. Because he saw Jesus looking at him. He said, Zacchaeus, he knows me. Come down. He needs me. He got out and he said, I'm going home with you. said, he loves me. And when he touched that kiss, he straightened up all of his mean stuff and got all of his family saved. When Zacchaeus got touched, he found out Jesus loved him. He fell in love with Jesus and the Jesus way and led his family to come the Jesus way. What are you doing? What touched you? To blow you up and blow you out and make you blow off instead of going and getting your family and bringing them to God and to the meeting house. What touched you to get your feelings hurt and said the preacher's too plain and radical and take your family and run off to the beaches and the mountains and the devil? If the Lord had a touch and said that's truth, let's go back and get some more. All the rest of it come and get your dose. And he touched the hearts of the men my friends, has he touched your heart? Has he filled your heart? He fills it with joy when he touches it. You have he quickened. You are no longer dead. You are no longer rebellious. You are no longer stubborn. You are no longer yielded to the flesh. To its lust. When he touches you, your heart to yield to Christ. Lord, what would thou help me to do? You see the difference? Who's touched you? What's touched you? Who's touched those other Baptist church members? What's touched them? Does it make them say, Lord, here am I, use me. When the coals off on the altar, was put on old Isaiah's tongue and touched him and cleaned him up. What did he say? Lord, hear my send me. Who oh, go for me, send me. Isaiah went out and he preached and he talked and he prophesied. Nobody heard him. They all turned on him. Nobody rebelled against him. Nobody moved. Isaiah went back and he said, Lord, I preached and I prophesied and I've gone right to where you sent me and not a one of them has got converted. How much longer, O oh Lord? He said, till there's not an inhabitant left, you stay where I put you. And just cause everybody in the country ain't a getting saved, everybody in the country ain't joined the church, honey, that didn't excuse you to quit on God. You said, here am I, Lord, send me. And he sent you to a place where they're rebelling and shutting up the ears and hardening their hearts. And you're saying, well, I ain't doing no good. Who told you that? If God sent you out there, you stay out there till God gets through with you. If God touched you, 
then that hard-hearted, rebellious, stubborn crowd ain't going to cool your touch off. So I want you to realize, my friends, God has touched people. He touched Mary Magdalene, who was a harlot. But when he touched her, she turned out to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And my friends, he touched a lot of other folks through the Bible. I'll not take time to call your attention. But what I want you to know tonight, every time the Lord touched anybody, they became followers of Christ and they became followers of this church. So the question is, who's touching a lot of these Baptists that jumped up and hollered, whoopee, I've got religion. And they've gone every other direction other than the direction of the church and the Lord and being missionary and evangelizing those around them. They're going out there to drink with them, cuss with them, dance with them, gossip with them, backbite with them, tattle with them and everything else. Who touched you? Who touched you, you dirty hypocrite? It wasn't God. Face the truth tonight. You don't find any. Old Paul quit his persecuting the church and fighting the church when the Lord touched him. And a lot of these others quit persecuting and fighting the church and quit bucking against God when the Lord touched them. So if he touches your heart, you'll fall in with him. You'll become a follower. You'll become a booster. You'll become an introducer. You'll become a lifter. You'll become a praiser. You'll become an honor. Instead of bringing disgrace and rebellion and reproach and, and full of rebellion and stubbornness and taking out and going other ways, Lord, what would thou have me to do? I ain't got time to go all the way through. You just go down through the Bible. Everybody the Lord touched, brother. I want you to know one thing. They went with him. Not against him. Jesus touched me. I was mean as hell. I was so mean when Jesus touched me, folks should get behind a tree when I went down the road. Folks was afraid of me. I was a problem to society. Call the law and I'd cut the telephone lines while it's calling them. Get the law out at them before they got through, I'd have them drinking with me. But when Jesus saved me, he changed me. He didn't touch my heels. He didn't touch my flesh. He touched my heart and that flowed into my flesh and my heels and my head and changed my tongue. I used to be the vilest, blasphemous cusser in Mississippi. But when he touched me, he broke my cussing apparatus and I've been singing amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Then my friends, I, when he touched me, I've been going around singing at the cross, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my soul roll away. When Jesus touched me, my friends, I began to say, oh, happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Happy night, happy night, when Jesus washed my black soul as white as snow. Oh, happy day, when I fix my choice on thee. My friends, I want you to know, when Jesus touches men's hearts, it makes them sing amazing grace. There is fountain at the cross. How firm a foundation. Instead of singing a bunch of Yankee Doodle, our soul, our music, and going out and singing a bunch of rock stuff, and a bunch of jig jag junk stuff. You want to sing those hymns that come from the heart instead of that which tickles your heels. Oh, we need the touch of God in our people's hearts, in our men's hearts, in our women's hearts, in our young people's hearts. Then, my friends, the touch of Jesus is a power touch. Powerful. It's a powerful touch. 
My friend, he gave me power over my weaknesses. He gave me power over my appetites. He gave me power over my speech. He gave me power over my thinking. He, when Jesus touched me, he let me come and have victory over the weaknesses of my flesh. It's a powerful thing when Jesus touches you. He puts power in you that gives you victory over the weakness of the flesh. He puts power in you that gives you uh, weaknesses over your rebellion. He puts power in you, my friends, that makes you victorious over the devil and sin and the flesh and the mind and the habits and the shackle. Listen, he gave me power to break the shackles. He gave me power to loose myself from the habits of sin and I've been free since. All the power that broke the shackles and the habits of sin on me, he did it. When he touched me, he broke those shackles. He broke those habits. The power of God got power enough just like old old Sam, Samson broke the green winch and broke the ropes and pulled up the post and went on. I want you to know, my friends, when Jesus touches you, he'll give you power to break the ties of sin, to break the flesh of the lust of sin, to break the powers of the devil and set you free and you can go out and be victorious over the weaknesses of your own carcass and your mind. He touches. It's a powerful touch when Jesus touches. Not all of that. My friend, when God touches man, it's an elevating touch. It's a lifting touch. Notice in Daniel 8.18, now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. I was on my face, grounded to the ground, defeated, lying out there, whipped and kicked and lying in the gutter. But when he touched me, it lifted me up out of the gutter. It got me out of the ditch. It lifted me out of the gutter and put my feet on the highway to the new Jerusalem. It elevated me from the gutters of sin and from the pits of sin and lifted me up to the highway that will lead me in where I need to go, where I want to go. My friends, the touch of Jesus elevates men, lifts them. Not only that, but also Psalms 40, 1 and 3 he lifted me out of the mire clay and set my feet on a rock. Hallelujah. Yeah. I'm no longer on sinking sand. I'm on a solid rock. There was a day when I'd swear day and night I'm not going to get any deeper in sin. When I'd try to pull up out of this, I'd sink deeper in this. Like quicksand. Like a monk in the marsh. Just getting deeper and deeper. But there was a day my friends, when he touched me and put my feet on solid rock, I've been walking on solid ground ever since. Singing how firm a foundation, you saints, for the Lord. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his right. On oh, Christ, a solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking, sinking sand. When he touches you, he'll put you on the solid rock. And my friends, it'll stay solid. Oh, being a sinking sand. We stop to recognize when he touches you. He puts us, elevates us from the muck and the mar and the clay and the pit to the solid rock. And my friends puts us in the rock of ages. And it clefts for us. Psalms 31. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up. The same power that created this universe, the same power that sets the planets in the orbit to where they stay there, and the same power, if you please, my friends, that's lifted everything else, has lifted us. The same power that lifts a sinner is the power that lifted the orbits into space and placed them there. And when Jesus lifts you, as a sinner, he'll lift you up to where you'll stay and where you'll want to stay. And if you don't stay, he'll whoop you till you have to stay. A lot of folks, I'd become a Christian. I'm afraid I can't hold out. Honey, don't worry about holding out. 
You get saved, you don't hold, he'll whip your britches off till you will hold it. Yes, he lifts us, my friends, to a higher plane. Now I want you to realize from seeking sand like they sang tonight, he lifted me with tender hands, he lifted me from shades of night, glory to God, to plains of light. Oh, praise his name. He lifted me from the shaking sands, from the shades of night. He lifted me where there's light. And from the quick sands of defeat and destroy, he lifted me. He lifted me. Oh, the touch of the Son of God in your heart will lift you up. And I want you to realize, praise his name. He's able. He has the power. When God touches man, not only, my beloved, is it a quickening, a changing, a powerful touch, a power of exalting you, but it's also a keeping touch. My friends, let's look at a passage or two. Let me read it for you. I, Ecclesiastes 3, 14. I know that. Don't guess, I know that. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, or anything taken from it, and God doeth it, that man should fear before him. What is it? My friends, it's a keep in touch. When God does it, you can't put nothing to it, you can't take nothing from it. God did it forever. And when the touch of God touches your heart, it's forever. He's not going to let it go a while and then quicken the touch. When he quickens your heart, you've been made alive. Neither can they die anymore, the equal under the angels, and are the children of the resurrection. Nah, we're born of an imperishable seed, an incorruptible seed that liveth and abideth forever. My friends, we stop. He that eateth of this bread shall never die. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. And so I want you to realize one thing. When God touches your heart, it's a keeping touch. It's a permanent touch. Notice, my friends. He said in John 27, 28, They that believe in me shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave me is greater than all. No one can pluck them out of my Father's hand. Under no circumstance, under no condition will I ever cast out any that's come to me. My friends, nobody can take them out of his hand. He won't cast them out. And God's back of all of it, nobody. So when God touches you, it's a permanent touch. When God touches that heart, it's touched forever. It can never be destroyed. It can never be undone. It can never perish. It's an everlasting life. It's an eternal life. It's an imperishable life that he touched you with. And we stop to realize then, my friends, look over in the book of Peter, the first Peter, the first chapter, and fifth verse, who are kept by the power of God through faith and through salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It's a keeping power. The touch of Jesus Christ in hearts is a keeping power. And what we need, my beloved, is get back into our churches, that keeping power. That power that keeps us in the straight and the narrow way that power and then we stop to realize he said that his love could never be affected by death or by principalities or powers or things present or things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall ever separate us from the love of God so I'm telling you when God touches your heart it's a touch that he never ceases to love he never ceases to care it's a forever touch and as we think about it tonight my friend I want you to realize, there it is. And we stop to realize when God touches the heart, it's a satisfying touch. Notice, for he satisfies, Psalms 179, for he satisfies the longing soul and filleth the hunger soul with gladness. He that drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but he that drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. It's a satisfying drink. He that eateth of this bread shall hunger and die. But he that eateth of the bread that I shall give him shall never hunger and shall never die. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. And when he touches you, he gives you satisfaction. You don't ever hunger anymore. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He gives me the bread of life, I don't ever hug anymore. He gives me the water of life, I don't ever thirst anymore. I, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures, that's satisfaction. He leads me to the start of still waters, that's satisfaction. He restoreth my soul. What was the matter with his dead and trespass and sin? And when he restores it, he quickens it and it never dies again. So if the Lord touches your heart, you got a life that'll never die. You got a life that'll never perish. You got a life that lives forever. So I shall not walk satisfied. If the Lord becomes your shepherd, you're satisfied. My friends, the bread satisfies, the water satisfies, the kind of life satisfies, and you're satisfied forever. The man who had for 38 years been waiting at the pool of Bethesda, for 38 years he tried to get something to happen. For 38 years he's waited, and everybody stepped in front of him. Everybody stood in his way. But when Jesus touched the man at the pool of Bethesda, my friends, he got up and walked again. Some of you been waiting 25 or 30 years for this touch. All you got to do is to come to Jesus and say, I can't get in for the hypocrites and I can't get in because there's so many people in my way. That's what the fellow at the pool of Bethesda said. Every time I try to get in, somebody gets in my way. Bless God, quit letting anybody get in your way and come to Jesus and let him touch you and he'll heal your paralysis of the last 25 or 30 years. You'll no longer be paralyzed by sin and hampered by sin and shackled by sin and crippled by sin and cursed by sin and cancered by sin and leprous with sin. If you'll let Jesus touch you, he'll clean you from within and you'll be clean as any man forever and ever. And I want you to realize the touch of Jesus will satisfy the longing that's in your heart. I, he'll put a He'll put a song in your heart. He'll put satisfaction in your soul. The world can't satisfy. He hadn't got it. The devil can't satisfy. The world's going to rot. The world's going to pass away. You don't want none of the world. My friends, it's yielded for God. It'll pass away. It's going to rot. It's pish. Hey, it's getting awful rotten and stinking right now. You don't want that mess? Get Jesus. He'll never rot. He'll never perish. My friends, you don't want the devil. The devil's going to get defeated. The devil's going to get destroyed. The devil's going to get put out of business. You don't want him. You need Jesus. The world cannot satisfy. Fame cannot satisfy. A lot of folks filled with fame can't be satisfied. Look at Hollywood. You saw what they said about it in the paper. It's been the bright lights of America for many years now. It's, a, it's the haunting place of sin in its worst time. All of the offspring of that sinful Hollywood bunch is coming up now. The seed of the evildoers has come, getting hatched out now. And Hollywood's become a dangerous place. Folks can't live there, can't live in peace, scared to death and so on. Before I leave this camp, I expect I'll preach a sermon on when the seed of the evildoers come up. My friends, I want you to realize we're heading that way in America. You better get your family in the will of God, in the church of God, in the kingdom of God, and get them headed God's way. Get them with a touch of God. Their positions won't help them. Their monies won't help them. He cannot satisfy. What they need is Jesus. My friends, Jesus is the touch that men needs in their hearts. And when God touches man, it's a peaceful touch. There was a man, the demonic man, Nobody could tame him. Society had dined him and wined him and danced him and dangled him till they, they could become afraid of him. They'd raked him. They dined him and wined him and danced him and dangled him until he become a dangerous character. And the law couldn't handle him. After the society got through dining him and drinking him and dancing him and dangling him, then the law couldn't handle him. He'd become a problem to human society. But when Jesus come along, the man who's tearing his clothes off and dancing with skeletons and screaming 
and pulling out corpses and hugging them up and running through the community with stinking corpses stuck all over him, screaming, horrifying the community, wrecking the community. Listen to me. While Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, was dangling the bright lights of the movie stars, now they got a bunch of spiritual corpses out there that's a stinking and a rotting and a killing and a raping and a murdering. And it's a hell fine thing. The law can't do nothing with them. The law can't handle them. All they need is a touch of Jesus. It's all they need. What your sons and daughters need, what your neighbors need, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus. A touch of Jesus will calm that demonic spirit. A touch of Jesus will stop that wild life. A touch of Jesus will stop this hideous way of rebellion and stubbornness. A touch of Jesus will clean up the hippies and straighten out the dope heads and sober up the drunks and stop the harlots and the homosexuals and bring them to their senses and put them right with God. Oh, the knee, my friends, clothed in his right mind. When Jesus touched the man, they found him sitting at Jesus' feet in his right mind, had his clothes back on. And when the heart is touched by Jesus, listen to me, when heart to Jesus touches your heart, you gals will put your clothes on, quit running around in shorts, and you men will put your clothes on, quit running around naked. When Jesus touches your heart, you get in your right mind, it'll sober you up. Sober you up. This man got in his right mind, and he sat down at the feet of Jesus, and he was clothed. Reason you won't tear your clothes off, go naked and act uh, and be beastly and brutish and get low down than dogs and hogs. Did you know the cows and the dogs and the hogs are not trying to undress? <laughs> Brute beasts still got their clothes. They pray if humanity is all wants to try and tear it off. That's because of the devil in you. And when Jesus touched this fellow's heart, he cleaned up the outside and got him in his right mind. And when you let Jesus touch your heart, it'll help a lot of you stop going to the psychiatric doctors and taking pills and going naked and having nervous collapses and so on. When Jesus touches your heart, it'll be peace. Peace, not as the world giveth, give unto thee, but an abiding peace that abides forever. My friends, I want you to realize, Jesus said, my peace I give in you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Hey, if you got God, you don't have to be afraid. If you got God in your heart, he's touched your heart. You don't have to be troubled. When he touches your heart, the trouble's gone. When he touches your heart, my friends, then you're not afraid. Hey, are you afraid? Are you in trouble? Jesus is the remedy. The touch of Jesus will solve a lot of that. Calm the storms and show me up and set you free. My friends, men down through the ages have tried it. And it's worked. He touched Moody. Moody lifted two continents nearer to God. He touched old Wesley. He touched Spurgeon. He touched Gypsy Smith. He touched Billy's uh, Sunday. He touched a lot of others. And they've touched the continent and brought them toward God. The need of this hour, God touch our preacher's heart. God touch our deacon's heart. God touch the heart of our people. You don't know your heel touch. You don't need a fleshly touch. You don't need an entertaining touch. You don't need a fleshly tickling. What you need is your heart touched. And when we get our heart touched, that'll settle the rest of it. Then, my friends, I want you to say, it's not only that. And God touched their hearts. How the touch of my beloved tonight is the resurrection touch. Thank God, my friends, when it gets too rough for us here, when it gets to where these old carcasses can't take it, when it gets to where some fevers burnt till we can't live in them, and the disease is eaten, rotted them till we can't stand, he'll give us one more touch. He'll touch us and say, come on up here. He'll give us the final touch. And when he touches us, we'll, be, we'll go up yonder. It's a lifting touch. It's an elevating touch. And when we get to where we can't make it here, hallelujah, he'll lift us out of it. He'll set us free. 
He'll take us on where nothing unclean and defileth and nothing that make us lie or nothing that aggravates us. He'll just lift us up there where we're free, 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 free. Oh, he touched me and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Has he touched you? Yes. 